and welcome again to our service and our YouTube channel at Tabernacle uh, Llwyn Hendy. I must say there is a sense of longing to see one another and to meet together as we normally do to worship. There is that hiraith growing already. But we pray that this short service will be a means of blessing, a means of encouragement to all of us and a means of bringing glory to God. Shall we hear God's word now from Psalm 95? Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. Come, let us bow down in worship let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker, for he is our God. Our reading today comes from the book of Revelation, the last book in the Bible, and chapters 4 and 5. After this I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. And the voice I had first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here. And I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit, and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there had the appearance of jasper and carnelian, a rainbow resembling an emerald encircled the throne. Surrounding the throne were twenty-four other thrones, and seated on them were twenty-four elders. They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings, and peals of thunder. Before the throne, seven lamps were blazing. These are the seven spirits of God. Also before the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. In the centre, around the throne, were four living creatures and they were covered with eyes in front and behind. The first living creature was like a lion, the second was like an ox, the third had a face like a man, the fourth was like a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around, even under his wings. Day and night they never stop saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was, and is, and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory, honour, and thanks to him who sits on the throne, and who lives for ever and ever, the twenty-four elders fall down before him who sits on the throne, and worship him who lives for ever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne, and say, You are worthy, our Lord and God to receive glory and honour and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. I wept and wept, because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw a lamb, looking as if it had been slain, standing in the centre of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. He had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. He came and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, 
each one had a harp, and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain. And with your blood you purchased men for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands, and ten thousand times ten thousand. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. In a loud voice they sang, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain, to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength, and honour and glory and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them singing to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honour and glory and power for ever and ever. The four living creatures said Amen and the elders fell down and worshipped. And we thank God for his holy word. Amen. Shall we turn now to the Lord in prayer? Let us pray. O Lord God and Heavenly Father, we thank you again for an opportunity to come and to worship you, to draw near to you through the Lord Jesus Christ in his name and in his merit and righteousness. And we come to you, Lord God of heaven and earth, Lord of hosts, Lord over all, unchanging God, the same yesterday, today and forever and ever. And we thank you that we can join the worship of heaven to you, our creator and our sustainer, you who are so gracious and compassionate to all, all your creatures. We thank you for every sign of general grace that brings cheer in these difficult days now. We thank you also for the gospel of grace, which unites us to you forever in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we do join in the worship of the Lamb who was slain. Oh, we thank you for the one who came from heaven, not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. We thank you again for the cross of Calvary, where he took our sins, our sorrows, and where he paid the price and penalty for us in our place, where he said, it is finished. We thank you that he rose again victorious on the third day and is now seated at the right hand of the Father. We thank you that he is there interceding for us in heaven, for all his people, for all who come to him. We thank you that he has sent his Holy Spirit to be with us at all times. We pray again for the presence and the ministry of the Holy Spirit now during this short service. And we thank you that soon he will appear again, not as a child, but as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We thank you he will come as King and as Judge of the living and the dead. And he will come to set up for all to see his kingdom, and he shall reign forever and ever. We thank you for our Saviour, for our Keeper. We thank you for the rock of our salvation. We thank you for our brother, our shepherd and our friend. Help us now to worship in spirit and in truth. Help us to hear your word. Help us to receive it. Help us to respond and apply it to our lives. Help us again to be salt and light in these times. Make us more like the Lord Jesus. Be merciful to our land in these days. Bring many lost souls to the Lord Jesus and to eternal life in him. To a real sustaining hope, a living hope in him. Accept us now, we pray. Forgive us, cleanse us through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
If I was to put a title for this message today, it would be The Lord Jesus Christ, President of the Universe. Are you feeling in these times, well, who's in control? Is there anyone in control? Is the world going on like a train that's a runaway train, hurtling faster and faster until it crashes? And it's easy for us to feel like that in these days, now because of the coronavirus. Perhaps you felt like that before, because we are in a world that is often uh, full of troubles, famine, earthquakes, tsunamis, war, terror, persecution of Christians, evil, extremism, stampings, killings, vandalism, etc. And now the virus has come. And maybe you've asked, maybe you've thought, well, who's driving this train? Is he, are they, whoever they are, in control? Well, chapters 4 and 5 in Revelation, or the book of Revelation, give us a glimpse of heaven. The Bible tells us that this is the power hub of the universe. And we see there, at the centre, is a throne. It's throne-centred. That means it's God-centred. Everyone's eyes are focused on the one on the throne. We hear that he is eternal, the same yesterday, today and forever, the one who was, the one who is and is to be. He's unchanging. And that's good to hear. He's the creator, the sustainer of this world. And of course, he's the saviour too. And he has a scroll in his right hand. So immediately we see that heaven is not detached from earth. It is not so remote as not to affect us or to be concerned about us. But the scroll is key, isn't it? The scroll is so important in that reading today. What does it mean? Well, it's a picture. It represents God's purpose in history. History being steered by God's hand according to his purpose to fulfil his purpose. His saving purpose, of course, to overthrow evil, the evil one, to turn sinners into those who become the image of Jesus, ultimately, to purge creation and set it free until it is a brand new creation. But who can open this scroll to fulfil God's will? And uh, you notice in the reading there was great sadness and despair as no one was found who was worthy, who was able to open it. But all of a sudden one of the elders says, oh yes, there is, there is one, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we read a little of his CV, as it were, to be president of the universe. Who is he? Well, he's described firstly as the lion of the tribe of Judah. Which is a reference uh, to an Old Testament prophecy, of course, that the king would come from Judah. It was partly accomplished in David. He was a king from Judah, but he wasn't the king. It was accomplished fully, of course, in God's Son, the Messiah the Lord Jesus, King of all. And the description of him as a lion is wonderful. It makes us think of power and strength and bravery. And we think then of his courage coming from heaven, leaving the glory of heaven to come to this world, this fallen, broken world that we often worry and despair of. Yes, but he came here. God loved this world and sent his only begotten son to the world. And then we see him withstanding Satan and temptation. Everything that was thrown at him, he stood firm, not like us, of course. And then we see his courage taking responsibility 
for the sin of the world. The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And through his resurrection, and in his resurrection, we see the power of the lion to rule with righteousness, doing what always what's right, and with true peace. Well, no one else comes near to him, of course. He's so qualified, so competent, and so worthy to be president of the universe. And then uh, he's described as the root of David. In the Bible, we hear of him as the son of David and the Lord of David. In his humanity as man, of course, he was born of David's line, a descendant of David. But as God, the son, he was David's Lord. And we read of the root of David, the root of Jesse, a prophecy in the, the book of Isaiah. The spirit of the Lord rests upon him, a spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and power, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. We see him, the wise one, putting God at the centre, not on the sidelines like other rulers and other presidents. We hear that he doesn't judge at face value, but righteously. We hear that he will slay the wicked and favour those who come to him and seek righteousness. So he can establish true peace, of course. He is so qualified, he is so competent, he is so worthy to be president of the universe. And then thirdly, he's the lamb that was slain. The lamb that was sacrificed and slaughtered in our place. The lamb makes us think of his tenderness, his meekness, being led away as a lamb to the slaughter, going voluntarily, giving his life for us, giving himself in our place. And then the emphasis is on the sacrifice. He was slain, of course, he was killed. He gave his blood, that means he gave his life to make us sinners like us, to be priests and kings, so that we can come to God through him directly and we can start to rule and to say no to sin in his strength and his power. He has paid with his blood for the right to crunch sin and Satan underfoot and to purge creation, to purge and set free his people. This is him, president of the universe, so qualified, so competent, so worthy. And in the Bible and in the book of Revelation that we'll concentrate on today, there are obvious clues that prove that the Lord Jesus Christ is president of the universe. It's so important for us to realise and to know today that God is God, that God is Lord over all, because he either is God over all or not at all. What's the first clue? Well, the first clue is that he presides with compassion. We see so much compassion in the way the world is run today. The sun comes, the rain comes on the good and the evil. It comes on the righteous and the unrighteous. We see signs now even of his general kind grace to all of us. The spring is coming once again. The seasons are turning. The sun is shining. And anything in these dark days that brings us cheer uh, and some comfort, of course, is part of God's general grace to us because, as we saw in the Lord Jesus on earth, he's full of compassion. But then we see that he is in charge. He opens the scroll, the seals, and he gives the seven trumpets to the seven angels. He sends the angels with seven bowls containing the wrath of God. And these are pictures, these are little pictures uh, in the book of Revelation. And what they tell us is this, 
that he is holding the reins of world history today. Yes, terrible things do happen. Yes, there are signs of wrath and judgment in some things that do happen. But there are limits and there are boundaries. If you cook, or if you're one that does some baking, you know when you do your preparing, you have to follow the recipe, and you've got to measure carefully. If you're making, uh, I've been thinking of making bread, maybe, I don't know. Well, you've got to put the right amount of yeast, just a little bit, the right amount of flour, and water, and sugar, and salt. Well, what shows us that the Lord Jesus is in control is that everything is measured carefully. When we think of war and famine and death and persecution, for example, earthquakes, we read in Revelation and these things that do come, it's only up to a point. It's only a certain amount. It mentions a quarter or at the most a third. Not that we must take that too literally but it's measured carefully. These things don't happen everywhere, to everyone, all the time. And that's a sign of God's goodness and patience because the Lord Jesus is the president. Yes, there is an element of warning. There is an element of punishment and judgment, of course. It reminds us that the day of judgment is coming. It reminds us that there will be everlasting judgment for those who choose to remain in rebellion against God and against the Lord Jesus. There is judgment. He is against sin. He is against everything that's wrong. But when we have these signs, they're only now measured. They're only up to a point. And we must remember we deserve far more. If we're honest and if we think how we have treated God as sinners, our maker, our keeper, our sustainer, our lack of love and honour and respect for him in our rebellion of sin. In fact, it's amazing that his measure of, uh, well, judgment and wrath is so measured. And we experience so much goodness. In fact, it's amazing that God is prepared to deal at all with a world such as ours, with sinners such as us. But he's still dealing with Satan. He's at work, but the Lord Jesus is in control. And Satan, the devil, has a very limited scope. He's got limited permission to create his trouble. That's what we read, of course, in the book of Job. What is amazing is that God is so lenient, so patient and so kind. And this proves Jesus, the Lord Jesus, is president of the universe. Secondly, his people are kept safe. We read in chapter 7 of the, the book of Revelation that his people are sealed with the Holy Spirit, of course. They're sealed so that they are safe and secure. Think of uh, food jars in the supermarket. They have a seal on them so that they are secure. They haven't been tampered with. Think of medicine packs now that so many people need in these days. They come and they're sealed so that nobody has done anything to them. And the Lord's people are sealed. And that secures that they will be victorious with the Lord Jesus, with the Lamb, and that they will be able to keep themselves faithful to him. Secondly, in this point, uh, their number will be complete. Each one of the Lord's people will come safely through the journey of life to heaven and to glory. There's a, a multitude later on in chapter 7 that no one can number. They've come through the tribulations of life. 
they're now in white robes. They've been washed and cleansed through the blood of the Lamb, through trusting, of course, in Jesus and his cross. They're out of the reach of hunger, thirst, sun, heat, tears, pain and loss, what they've experienced during their lifetime. They're now with him, who is their shepherd, drinking from the fountains of living water forever. Then we see that his people, as they pray, incense, as it were, goes up to God. The lovely picture. What is that then? Well, the incense is the intercession of the Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. He is the one who is now in heaven, interceding, pleading for us. The one who's died for his people, of course. Because of that, he's pleading. He's making sure that we will be kept safe and that we'll persevere to the end. He gives us his Holy Spirit. He gives us his grace and his strength. He keeps us because he is pleading for us at the right hand of the Father. And the Holy Spirit also. We read that when we pray, sometimes we don't know how we should pray. But the Spirit intercedes for us with groanings that are beyond words. And that's why we receive powerful answers. That's why our prayers go to heaven. They are treasured and kept. Then the work of the gospel comes to life again and again. There's a constant reviving. In chapter 11, we see that there are two witnesses. And this is the witness of the gospel, of course. And they are put to death by the enemy. And the enemy rejoices. But then, in a short time, they come back to life. And the witness goes on. And that's how it is with the gospel. That's how it always has been. Throughout the world, throughout history, at times, the cause of the gospel seems very low. The voice of witness is very quiet. And then it revives again. Then it comes to life again. That's because the Lord Jesus is president of the universe. Then we read of the accuser, the devil, Satan, being silenced. The saints are enabled to stand against him, to conquer the old dragon. He is the one who accuses us who says we shouldn't be accepted, who says we're too great a sinner to be received by God, to be called God's people. And he's the one that led us to sin in the first place. But we read that they silenced the accuser through the blood of the Lamb. Because the Lord Jesus died for us, paid the price of our sin, there's no accusation now. We're free from every accusation. Because of what he has accomplished for us. And our testimony to God's grace can continue. Whatever he says and whatever he tries to do and however he tries to stop us. But no, he'll be silenced. And finally, in this point, the Lord's people don't bow down to the enemy. We hear of two beasts. Of course, it's a dramatic picture. It's all in the code of a type, uh, the book of Revelation. First of all, there's the beast of the sea. And uh, ultimately, of course, it's Satan. It's under his control, this beast. It stands for unbelief, ungodliness, worldliness, atheism. And so many are blinded and deceived by this beast as it is today. But the Lord's people, those who have their name in the Lamb's book of life, are safe. They don't bow down. They're not blinded. They're not seduced by the beast. They're safe also from the beast of the land. There's a beast on the sea coming from the outside. There's a beast of the land as well. And that, of course, uh, is uh, falsehood, false prophets, false teaching in the church. In the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. But the Lord's people, they don't bow down. They're not sucked in. They're able to stand firm until the end. How? Why? Because Jesus is president of the universe. 
the third clue that proves to us that uh, Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus, is president of the universe, is that today, these days, are days of grace. What does that mean? Well, the gospel is still proclaimed. The gospel is still to be heard and believed today. In chapter 6 of Revelation, when the first seal is opened, a rider on a white horse with a bow and a crown goes out. And he's victorious. And of course, uh, he shoots his arrow from the bow. And that is a representation of the Lord Jesus and uh, the gospel going out in the power of the Holy Spirit and coming into the hearts of men and women and boys and girls, with people coming to repent, to see their sins and to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, coming into his kingdom. Then, later on in chapter 10, we hear of a little scroll that is given to John the Divine, and it represents the word of God, the word of the gospel. First of all, it's sweet, because he's told to eat it, and the grace of God is sweet. The grace of the gospel is sweet. To know of God's mercy to us is forgiveness. To know that we are accepted in the Lord Jesus, that we have this relationship of love with God. The love of God is poured out into our hearts through Jesus Christ. It's so sweet. But also, there is a bitterness when he swallows it into his stomach. And the gospel calls for self-denial. Yes, there's a battle against the evil one, of course. And there's call uh, to die to ourselves. And we can face all types of troubles and persecution. But it shows that God's purpose of salvation will be carried out throughout every nation on earth. And the gospel, of course, is proclaimed now throughout all the earth in God's goodness. Then, thirdly, in this point, we have the message of three angels in chapter 14. Message that comes from heaven. What is it? Well, it's the gospel message. It's a gracious warning, this is, to every nation, tribe and tongue. Babylon is going to fall. What does that great empire stand for? Well, unbelief, human pride and boasting, the kingdoms of man and their power. Yes, it's going to fall. Each one of them, of course. And the call is to run to God, to run away from these things and to run away from God's judgment upon them and to come to the Lord Jesus Christ, to run away from his wrath, to run away from his judgment, to run to the Lord Jesus now. It's a call to bow down in worship to the Lord, to make sure he's our Lord and our King and our Saviour. And there's a promise, of course, of eternal life, heavenly life, and rest in the Lord. Yes, the gospel is still proclaimed and still shared in these days, despite everything. Why? Because Jesus is president of the universe. And finally, uh, there is sure victory for him, the Lord, and his people. And the book of Revelation is full of songs. And I'm going to refer to four of them now. In chapter 7, I spoke earlier of the multitude that no one could number. Well, they're singing. What are they singing? That salvation is from God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the one who has planned everything, the one who's put everything into operation, and the one who will complete the plan of salvation perfectly, from concept to completion. And they're singing about it. They're rejoicing in it, of course. Then we hear in chapter 11, a song of heavenly voices, giving praise and thanks that God now has taken full possession of the kingdoms of the world. Christ, of course, will appear as King of kings and Lord of lords. He is king now, but we don't see him now. He will appear 
when he comes again. And of course, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And then uh, we read those wonderful words. And he shall reign forever and ever. Then there's the song of the 144,000. Again, God's people, the complete number in heaven, it's not a literal number at all. The song of those who have been redeemed, those who have been saved and kept safe, those who have been preserved until the end. Yes, they are singing a song of God's wonderful works, his works of salvation, his works of preservation, his faithfulness and his goodness. And then finally, there's the song of those that are victorious over the beast and his image and his people in chapter 15. Again, giving praise to God for his marvellous deeds in salvation and his victory over Satan, over the devil. His ways are just and true. That's what they sing. The songs of victory, the songs of safety, the songs of salvation. Why will they be sung? How can they be sung? Because Jesus is president of the universe. So we thank God for his word to us today. Let's remember he is presiding over everything through his son, the lion and the lamb. He is gracious and kind, very measured in the plagues, the difficulties and the signs of judgment. He makes sure that his people are kept safe on their journey through this life till they come to glory. He has provided the gospel, good news of forgiveness, a real hope in this dark world, bringing us to a relationship with God that can never be broken. Peace with God through Jesus Christ our Lord. He is sure to be victorious. I remember one person telling me that the theme of the Bible, the theme of Revelation is Jesus wins. And that for us should be a great source of comfort, real hope, confidence and joy today and at all times. Can I ask you as I finish, are you on the winning side? Are you in the kingdom of the Lord Jesus? Come to him today. Are you in Christ? Are you one of his? Rejoice. Keep your eyes focused on him. Be confident in him, his word and his promises. He's presiding over all and everything. And to him be the glory and honour forever and ever. Amen.